right. So I am Craig Maloney, and I will be talking a little bit about one of the other pieces of uh, GNU technology, software, whatever you want to call it. Um, this is the uh, language scheme. Um, there's also Guile and Racket. So there's three types of folks that will be interested in this talk. The first will be the ones who already know what a Lisp is and are like, oh my god, he's going to be talking about Lisp. Perish the thought. There's others of you for whom your .emacs file has probably gained sentience and probably already fills out the captures and says, no, I am not a robot, you insensitive clod, I'm an Emacs. Uh, and there are some of you who are going to be like, eh, whatever he's doing up there. I promise you this will be painless. This is an excellent language. But let's get started a little bit earlier on about where our story begins. So I've been learning JavaScript as a bit of a front-end developer type thing. And uh, I've been really enjoying learning JavaScript. I love front-end development. It's so wonderful. Uh, but then I was reading around, and I found somewhere that said that JavaScript borrowed a lot from Scheme. And I'm like, really? It borrowed some from Scheme, huh? Well, I guess I'll go and learn some Scheme then, <laughs> rather than learning about front-end development. <laughs> but it's not quite as orthogonal as you might imagine. Now there's a quote here, and unfortunately it goes straight off the screen. Uh, the JavaScript C-like syntax including curly braces and the for statement makes it appear to be an ordinary procedural language. <laughs> but this is misleading because JavaScript has more in common with functional languages like Lisp or Scheme than with C or Java. And there's this link here uh, where he talks about uh, disabusing this, this uh, notion that JavaScript is Scheme, but I digress. So why would you play around with Scheme? Well, Every time that someone mentions Lisp, they tend to start talking about weird things, you know, like weird symbols and power and all this other wonderful stuff. Like, you can make amazing technology with this. And it's like, Whoa, I want some of that. I want to be able to summon the power of the machine. But really, all those Lisp folks are telling you, it's just a lot of fun. You know, it's a lot of fun learning a Lisp type language. So what we'll cover with this? We'll cover a brief history of the scheme language, uh, some of uh, this scheme syntax, uh, and I'll cover two of the implementations out there. There are about, I think, a billion implementations of scheme out there, probably with more on the way. Um, so I'll narrow the scope down to only two of the implementations that are out there. So what is a scheme? Well, it was created uh, back in ye old early times by Guy L. Steele and Gerald J. Sussman. Uh, it's one of the dialects of Lisp, which I actually had this conversation where someone had said, well, what is a Lisp? Uh, Lisp is an old family of languages back in the 1950s. Um, who was the originator of Lisp? I think it was MIT McCarthy. McCarthy, that's right. I was trying, I blanked on the name for a second. Uh, uh, and that was... Uh, I think we got it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Lisp stood for something... Lisp processor. Lisp processor. Yes. Yes. And that's going to get a little... There's all sorts of wonderful things about Lisp, but I'm not going to devolved too much into that. The development of Scheme is, is documented in the Lambda papers, which were around the 1975, 1980s era. So as far as Lisps go, it's a newer Lisp. Um, and it's had many standardization efforts, which I'll allude to there. But, uh, and I'm going to basically <laughs> paraphrase this a little bit. It basically says that the family of Lisp languages there's no real standard for Lisp. Basically, you can call yourself a scheme, uh, I should say, uh, the unhappy distinction of being the world's most unportable programming language. Uh, so the common features of them are lexical scope, lexical scope, dynamic typing, list structure, higher order functions, proper tail recursion, garbage collection, macros, and some form of S expression based lexical syntax. You can read all the information about that. So let's start off a little simple. Uh, there are different data types in a Lisp type language and uh, scheme in particular. So up here you have integers, you have floats, you have a string, notice double quotes. Uh, true or false, false and true are preceded by a little pound sign and F or T. And then this, which is a symbol. And I'll get into a little bit more about what symbols are in just a second. You also have lists. So all of these three 
examples here are, make the same type of list. So you have the keyword list, and then the numbers three, four, and five. You have this, which is a little tick mark, which is basically shorthand for saying list three, four, five. And all of these are shorthand for this function called cons. And what cons does is it takes this value, and then the next pair of values, which is this whole list, takes that, and takes this whole pair of values, and takes cons five, and then this, which is the empty list. And then combines them all together and makes that. You don't need to know all this stuff, the consing and all that other wonderful stuff, it's just that's three ways to make a particular list. I'll get to more about why that's important in just a second. Yes? Which tick mark is that? That is the, the one under the quote, double quote. Okay. Yeah, it's not the back tick. I'm not even going to touch back ticks. That's like you know, crazy stuff in there. Uh, the different data types. So I decided rather than try and explain these, I'll have the functions do that. So in the very top, you'll see a, a string with double quotes. And that's true. That is a string. There is a concept of a symbol with a single tick mark. And that is uh, true as well. If you try and say, is that is the same thing as a string? That's not the same thing as a string. Symbols and strings are different. And I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Number. Is this a number? Yeah, that's a number. Uh, float is also a number. That's true. You see this. Complex numbers. It understands how to do complex numbers. And that is still a number. But you'll notice, too, that it's not a real number. It's a complex number. It's an imaginary number. If you remember your algebra and calculus and all that other wonderful stuff. That's an imaginary number. And that gets into mathematics. And yes, I got a D minus in Calc 2, so don't ask me about math. <coughs> so another bit of data type. You see at the very top, it says real, 2 slash 3. That's not division. That is actually 2 thirds. What Scheme has is it has the ability to bring out exact numbers. So you're not trying to convert everything over to a float like you do in certain languages, like, um, like Perl converts everything over into floats. And that. So that is two-thirds. That is exactly two-thirds, according to Scheme, as opposed to this, which you have 2.0. 2.0 is a float that's never going to be exact, according to computer math, so that's going to come back and be false. However, it's still an integer, so that's 2.0, that's an integer. Exact, as far as uh, division, so that's 4.0 divided by 2.0, that's still float. So that comes back as false. <coughs> Excuse me, let me drive here. Is that an integer? Yes, it comes back as 2.0, and that's still an integer, <coughs> so that's true. Greg, why, why did you say that 2.0 cannot be exact? Because that is a float. So there's, the, there's a difference between 2.0 as a float, <clears throat> pardon me, versus um, 2 point, or just 2. If that was 2, then that would be exact. Uh, okay. Well, what I might explain it is if you have a computation that returns 2.0, it, it might have actually been trying to return 2.00001. Yeah. But there's no way to distinguish that. On the other hand, if you have a computation that returns two, no decimal point, it really is exactly two. So scheme makes a difference because even though you've entered in 2.0, you may not have been what produced it. So there could be uh, error due to uh, function. That's correct. Yes. 2.0 is a float, and how can it be? How come integer 2.0 is true? Because. <clears throat> Because it considers that easily promote that to an integer. Yeah, it promotes it over to an integer. It says they can do that. So that's an integer. 2.1. 2.1 would not. Yes. Yeah, but an integer is exact also, so I'm confused. It's not as <clears throat> it's not as confusing. And for whatever reason, I'm losing my voice, so I apologize. <clears throat> so I mentioned before about string uh, symbols. All right. So what happens with these is they become interned. So every one of these symbols becomes part of a simple table. So think of it kind of like a hash table, in a sense where every one of them is looking at the same piece of memory. So if I define foo as quack, and I define bar as quack, they're both equal. They're both pointing at the same piece of memory in here. So they're both true, okay? 
as opposed to strings. Strings do not do that. Strings are different objects whenever they're created. So foo, quack, points to this particular string. If I define bar that goes to this quack, it's different altogether. So they're not equal, not the same piece of memory. <clears throat> Question? Yes. <coughs> oh. Yes. Yeah, so is this similar to what, for instance, like Python does with some of the integers? In a sense, yeah. In, in like the C Python. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, let's try some mathematics here for a second. Um, so in a list type language, you start off with the operator first, and then the arguments for that afterward. So in this case, that's 2 plus 3, that equals 5. This one is 2 minus 3, that equals 1. 2 times 3 is equal to 6, and then 2 divided by 3 is 2 thirds. That's how it comes out in there. So let's take a look at some more math. Now, if you do a plus, anything that follows that afterward, thank you. <laughs> It works. It's go-go juice. <clears throat> starting to sound like Steve Jobs. Um, anything that follows after this is part of the operation. So each one of those gets added up and becomes 30 at that point. You can also nest these together. So this multiplies this, subtracts, or, and again gets subtracted from 4, becomes negative 26. If you divide, divide all these together, it becomes two fifteenths. Yeah, it's fun. And then all of these multiplied together becomes five twelve. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about variables. So in order to define a variable, you say define what you want to call that variable, and then the variable, the uh, value of that variable afterwards. So let's say we want to define two as two just to be confusing. So if we wanted to add two and two together, we get four out of there, because you have the variable two equaling two, and the variable two equaling two. Well, add those together, you get four. Now if I want to redefine two as three, I can do that. I can add those together, and I get back six. So two and two equals six. Not even confusing at all. All right, <clears throat> you can also, have the variable take on the value of an operation. So if I add one and one, I can get two out of that. If I want to get four, I can take those variables again, two and two, add those together, I get four. And if I want to get eight, I can you know be really crazy and do multiply four and two together, and I get eight. Okay, making sense? Yes. So uh, if, if you divide all those, then you ran. Where, where, where does that resolve? Does that resolve as the execution uh, comes to that statement, or does that, does that pre resolve? This, uh, you're getting into, right now I'm, I'm using the REPL, uh -huh. the read of print loop. Um, I'll show a little bit of some code and how that works and how it gets up. Yeah. I'll show a little bit of that later on. Yeah. Any other questions? That's all. Correct. Yes. How did you get to this when you were trying to learn jobs? <laughs> I fall down a lot of rabbit holes. Yeah, I don't know where to get it. One, one too many clicks in your browser. Sorry. That's all right. I have a question. Yes. Is, so if the um, symbols are kind of like a dictionary or hashes in a dictionary, what's the scope of that? Is that total scope? Is that? Let me talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So latent typing. So. In some languages, once you define a variable, you can't really change its type. This uses latent typing, or you can probably call it duct tape typing if you wanted to. That's what Python calls it. But the idea is that whatever value it gets associated with it last is what that type is. So if you define a duck as four, say, is that, you know, is that a number? Yes, of course, four is a number. So if I set, if I reset that value to, of duck to quack, the symbol of quack, is that a number? No, it's not going to be a number. It's never going to be a number. So you can reset the type of that value at on the fly. You're not locked to it in certain languages. Instead of set exclamation, can you do define? You could as well. Just um, set usually is whenever you define something. 
it, it'll overlay it. Cert there are certain times where if you try and redefine something, it'll give you an error. Do you remember, know how to? I, I think if you, I'm not 100% sure that it's been a couple months. I think if you said define duck quack, it would basically say you can't define four to be quack. Right. Uh, yeah. No, there's there's certain things yeah. about that where okay. we won't do that. Well, I've seen languages too where you define a new instance of something. It, the old instance remains, but you can't reference it. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into a little bit of that as well. So here's some built-in functions uh, that you can use. You've seen the number function um, used for determining whether something's a number, whether something is zero or a symbol. Uh, zero. You can say, okay, is this equal to zero, yes or no? Four is not equal to zero, so that's going to be false. Uh, if you say, you know, this is a string, yes, that's going to be a string. Is this null? So no, uh, the empty list comes back as null in this language. So, and also it's a list as well. So if you want to test if something is null, you can do that with the null uh, function. So let's do a, a quick little uh, function, procedure. They call them procedures in Scheme, but they're functions pretty much everywhere else. Um, so these are two ways of defining a function or a procedure. If I use free function and procedure, can you guys just, you know, map it in your head that I'm just talking about the same thing? Well, no, you mean subroutine. Thank you. <laughs> oh! <laughs> well played. So if I'm defining this function square x as multiplying both of these together, what this does is it takes this, this whole thing and then maps it to this variable. I can also do the same thing. And the, we used the, the term lambda, and I'm going to explain a little bit of that. It gets into lambda calculus, and if you really want to go into some huge rabbit holes, learn about lambda calculus. It's not hard, it's just... Um, anyways, so what this does is it says, take this function, with this parameter x, and then associate this piece here, multiplying the x by x, to this value here. So both of these are equivalent. Both of them do the same thing. Both of them define a function square. It takes one parameter x, and then when run, we'll run this piece of code here to multiply those two numbers together. So if we do a Pythagorean theorem, remember a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is more math than I've done in a pre yeah. presentation in a while. Uh, so if I take this square of 5 and square 6, add them together, I get the answer, which is 61. Out of that. You can see the uh, quadratic equation up there. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Your presentation, you can put a quadratic if you want. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this gets into a, a little bit of another implementation detail, which is that procedures are variables. So if I define foo x as just returning x, so the function foo returns x. If I show you the trace, and this is in uh, Guile, you can tell it to trace it back. You may notice that this memory address here, the 1434C60, that's where that particular uh, piece of procedure lives. Mm -hmm. All right, and if I run that, it comes back with four. Now, if I say define bar as foo, it will take this memory location, stuff it into bar. So when I run this, it will say, okay, this is where foo lives. This is where bar is. Bar is the same thing as foo in this instance. Mm -hmm. So it will, oh, I should have told it. Uh, okay, so yeah, I tell it to trace back bar. It says I'm actually running foo, and foo is equal to five. Okay? Right. Keep that in mind, because I'm gonna screw things up. So in this instance, I tell it foo instead Display I refuse. So foo is now pointing to I refuse. Now what do you expect bar to do? You would expect bar to say I'm still hooked up to foo, ergo I'm going to refuse. But it doesn't do that. It still points to the old memory location, which then returns back four. Okay? Now even though foo no longer exists, 
it still points to that old function. If I run food here, it comes back and says, I refuse, and gives me an unspecified trace and all that other wonderful stuff. So it gets a little important when we start talking about some of the other stuff here. So lambda. But I already showed you the square um, piece where I define the square both of those ways with lambda. Now, one of the other things that you may notice with lambda is I can create this code without saying define and without telling it where to go. So if I define it like this, it says, okay, I've defined it and here's the procedure. Here's how I can run it. Now, I'm not going to be able to run it that way unless I do some really interesting hanky-panky and you know, figure out how to get this into, into a variable. But, and people may notice this from JavaScript, and why it has this crazy ass thing where you have to put parentheses around the whole thing or put the parentheses at the very end to get an immediate invoking uh, function. So if I put parentheses around this, it says, all right, you have this here, here's the value of four, drops that in there, and then pops out 16. So it immediately invokes this function, throws in the argument in here, and then here comes 16. So JavaScript borrowed that nomenclature, in a sense, from the scheme. So if we wanted to do multiple arguments for this, so if you wanted to pass along x and y and do kind of a daft, you know, add everything together, you can do that um, by saying, okay, lambda x, y, with arguments three and four, add them together, and then out pops seven. You can also do it as a procedure. Um, so here, you have both of those arguments there, and basically the same thing. And you can do a lambda version of that as well, where you just pop it into L add, and it pops out there. Is that making sense? I feel like I'm sort of losing a few folks. Hold on. <laughs> so conditionals. What happens with a conditional in, uh, in scheme? So if you say if, and say some conditional in here, so let's say zero, if zero equals zero, what it will do is it will display true here. It won't execute this code at all. This code is pretty much dead for this, because hopefully zero will never not equal zero, otherwise we've got problems. Um, so what Scheme will do too is it will do lazy evaluation. So anything that it doesn't have to execute, it won't. It won't try and evaluate at all, which gets into Condition, other conditionals. So in this case, we have a different type of conditional. And this is similar in a sense to a, a case switch type situation, but a case switch where the first thing that gets executed will, autom will automatically break out. It won't, you don't have to evaluate the break. So you see in this case, if zero, yes, this is going to be zero, or if not zero, one. This is also true as well, but it never gets evaluated because this gets evaluated and it breaks right out. So it evaluates the true, boom, done. Making sense? Yes? Are the new lines, the fact that those are on different lines, important? Or is it, is it the parentheses? The parentheses are what matters here. And this is also one of the other fun things about, about list type languages is that you have parentheses all over the place and it's, it's not uncommon to see like about five or six parentheses at the very end of it. Yes? Do all the parentheses fail? They should. Otherwise it gets very cranky. But the quotes don't. Editors, yeah. editors are very good about helping you with that. Yeah. Especially certain electric modes. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Emacs electric mode. Yes. So equality. Now I mentioned EQ. And EQ seems kind of, kind of deaf because it only evaluates things that are pointing at the same object, same memory location and whatnot. Um, so in this case, we have far, uh, foo and bar both pointing to the same thing, five here. All right, are those equal? Yes, because they're pointing to the same object. Um, is five equal, to, is this equal to this? Yes, because it's pointing to a five and that evaluates um, to the same location or whatever. Um, there's a different equality. Yes, go same ahead. Adam. Uh, same atom is the word. Same atom. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Whereas opposed to this equality, um, we're going to see a little inequality here because you have two strings that are both pointing to the same string area, 
Are they the same? No, they're not going to be the, the same. The time is now 8.30 and the library will be closing in 30 minutes at 9 p.m. Please be advised that the internet connections will shut down approximately 10 minutes before closing. Thank you. So the recommendation, if you're doing string comparisons, I either use equal or uh, string equal question mark. Um, I'm just going to show you equal question mark. So if I have both of these strings, you know, foo is equal to five, bar is equal to five, are they equal? Yes, they're equal. I mean, yeah, you can tell that they're equal. You can also do string equal. Yes, they're going to be equal as well. So the thing to keep in mind with that is that if you're trying to test for equality and you're unsure of whether they're going to be pointing to the same atom or not, use something like equal uh, instead of using EQ. Otherwise, you'll get into trouble. Mm. So this also works for lists as well. Uh, so if I define them both basically the same list, are they equal? Yes. Are they equal in this sense? No, they're not pointing to the same atom. Those are both pointing to different lists. So that's going to come back as false. So that's where you can bite yourself. Okay. Most important code in the entire computing uh, realm is the Fibonacci sequence, and we'll explain it just a little bit. Um, this gets into one of the benefits of a scheme type language, which is recursion. And in fact, they use the scheme over at MIT to teach computer science and to teach recursion, because recursion is extremely simple in scheme. So if you take a look at this, First condition, if n equals 0, return to 0. If n equals 1, return a 1. Otherwise, return n minus 1 and n minus 2 and add those together. So, I mean, you can take a look at that and it's pretty, pretty standard how it works. I'm not going to get into like tail recursion and all that other kind of stuff, but that gets really kind of crazy. Um, but if I run that for 30, I get back that answer. Okay? And leaving. <laughs> Mapping. So one of the functions of, um, of a scheme type language is map. And what this will do is I will multiply these together for all these particular numbers. So if I say map, what it will do is it will say, okay, for each of these in this particular list, run this particular function. So map. So for these, map this function and run it on there. So we'll start off one, four, six. Etc. And then they'll basically do the squares. Map each of those values onto that. Function. Yes. And I've got a better example of that in a second. But there's also a command filter. So if I want to filter out anything that is, in this case, if I want to find anything that is even, I want to find anything that has a remainder of zero whenever I do a division on it. So I filter out all of these, all of these in this list against this function here, which figures out if the remainder is zero, when, uh, if I divide it by two. So out pops out all the even numbers. Or if I run this against, hey, all, are all of these numbers, out will pop out all the numbers in here. So this string doesn't pop out. How does that work? Well, let me show you a little bit of the difference of map and filter. So if we take that number function again and map it out, what you'll see here is this is um, all the, the Boolean values that show up out of there. So you have a true, a true, a true, and a false. That's how these map out. So the last one is not a number, so that's going to return back a false. So the difference with this is when you do a map, it will apply this to each of those and then return back the results of this function. Since I'm doing a Boolean function in here, that's what we're getting. We're getting a mapping of that. Now what filter does is it takes that and maps it up, or doesn't map it out, but it says, okay, which one of these are true? And only the ones that are true out of here will pop out in this list. Okay? Making sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk about local variables. So each procedure has its own local environment. This gets into your question about environment and how far up it goes. So what we do is we can create local variables in here with let. I don't know exactly how it works with the symbol table. I think the symbol table is global, so anything that's in there automatically gets thrown in. Is it? 
Well, if they're, I think they're still implementing in QMU what they call T-maps, where you uh, have a table mm -hmm. of uh, symbol and value, and there's a marker in it. Each time you enter a function, just as the program counter gets uh, stacked, so too does the pointer to that uh, the top of that uh, T-map. Okay. And when you do a uh, let, it tells it to pull that off again. Other because that. So it's, it's environment dependent. Scoping. Yeah. Right. That allows you to implement the dynamic scoping. Because okay. normally your dynamic scoping is that same T table inherited. All right. Cool. All right. So if we define S at the very beginning of this, and this gets to your top down thing, um, where it gets defined, we define S as 42. We throw this through this false answer thing and say, okay, we create our own S value, and that S value is going to be false. So we're going to display this. So if I tell it false answer, it will come back as false. You expect it to be, you know, if, it, if we don't have scoping, then that will overwrite. But it do, we do have scoping, so that stays within the false answer. It doesn't come out of there. And so if I display S when I'm outside of there, I get 42 again. So you can do a little bit of scoping in there. But what you also get is you get closure. Closures are fun. Closures are... Um, a way for you to keep values around in a function without necessarily saving state and without the function necessarily ending. So in most languages you would say this would end. So it would always be starting from the top, getting counter equal to zero, and it would always start, you know, whatever the counter is, blah, blah, blah. But in this case, what happens is it doesn't stop. It doesn't get out of there. It always sticks around in there. So if I call this function, what happens is, so I call it the first time it's four, second time it's eight, second, third time it's 12. So that lambda makes sure that that stays around in that particular function area without getting pulled out. It doesn't actually end. And this is a crazy thing. This is also another one of those things that's in JavaScript. So JavaScript, you know, you have a, a function and you have closures and people talk about, ooh, mysterious closures and whatnot. This is what it's doing. It's basically hanging around in its own environment. Okay? Now I know this is a lot, a, a taste of what Scheme is, and I hope it's giving you a good taste in your mouth and not a horrible taste in your mouth. Um, so let's talk about some of the implementations real quick. Uh, one of the implementations that's available is called Guile. And how this relates to the GNU tool, GNU tool chain talk is that Guile is part of the GNU project. This was the grand unified vision in order to make it so that Scheme was going, to, well first off, Scheme was going to be the scripting language that everyone was going to use. <laughs> Scheme was going to be uh, in every single, like every single GNU project was going to be extensible via Scheme. So you have things like uh, GNU Cache, GDB, LilyPond, GUIX, which is uh, in, coming out, it's a package manager for uh, for the GNU project. They're trying to do a scheme-based, functional-based package management system for a Linux, uh, GNU Linux system. It never really got that far, unfortunately. Uh, and part of the reason was that TCL was out at the same time, and then this upstart called Python came around and started taking over the scripting duties of a lot of this stuff, but it's kind of cool. Um, also, G, uh, Guile is not just for scheme. You can also do other languages in it. Someone implemented ECMAScript 6, or sorry, ECMAScript 3. It's not a complete implementation. It's not going to give Node any, any problem in the near future, unfortunately. Um, but it's kind of cool. So let me do a quick demo of what that looks like. Uh, So, and it's basically a uh, run a value print loop uh, scheme interpreter. And I'm not going to do anything really crazy with it. What I'm going to show you though is uh, I'm going to have all these slides available online. So. Because it wanted to be extensible, they wanted to figure out nice and easy, clean ways to get you to have a scheme compiler in your C code. 
So one of the demonstrations that they have for that is called Simple Guile. And you'll see that you um, have a main module where it creates the boot uh, environment for it and then generates a shell really quick. So what does that look like? Now this is a little daft, but I mean because it's a demo, but it basically brings you into the uh, so scheme. It's easy, easy to embed a guy on yeah, exactly. the interpreter into your seat. The problem is I'd like to show you something a little bit crazier, you know, something you know where things are moving around and flashing and whatnot. All of the code examples are either for uh, Guile 1.8 or 2.2. What Ubuntu ships with is 2.0. What Ubuntu ha will ship with until uh, 1704, what they've shipped is like 2.09. Now they ship with 2.013. So, unfortunately, it's I can't. Two two. Yeah, they haven't shipped with 2.2 yet. So, I apologize for that. However, I can show you one of the other versions of Steam, which is Racket. And what makes Racket interesting is Racket is um, kind of an educational <coughs> version of Scheme. All of them kind of have educational roots, but this one really took it home and tried to make something that students could take home and really understand what the heck was going on under the covers. So uh, they described it in several books, uh, How to Learn Programming in Realm of Racket. Realm of Racket is an awesome book. Um, if you've ever seen Practical Common Lisp, um, I think it's Practical or Land of Lisp, sorry, Land of Lisp, where it's got the comic uh, version of the uh, uh, alien on the front cover. That's a really cool book. And this is uh, along those similar things where it's kind of games and other sort of stuff. Um, so there's also a graphical IDE for that called Dr. Racket, DR Racket for short. And let me do a quick demo. So one of the things that I tend to do when I'm learning a new language is I write a shut the box in it. Shut the Box is an old game where you have nine tiles and two dice, d6, that you roll. So this is the environment DR Racket, or Dr. Racket. It looks very much like Macintosh booting up, which is kind of crazy. Anyways, old, old school Macintosh. And so here's some of the code. This is all available on GitHub if you want to take a look at it. We also have a debugger and a way to run that code. So here I have an implementation of shut the box where it shows you the tiles. I implemented a hint mechanism in there which is basically a filter where it will show you all the tiles that you can use. You can shut. So it'll show all the different combinations and such. So, I'm not going to go too far into this, sadly, because we ran out of time. But that's, and that all, all that code is available on my GitHub as well. Anywho, um, so there's a lot of ways you can go with this. I mean, you can just say, well, that was kind of interesting, or you can kind of take a look at it and see what's available to you. And I hope you take the second approach to it. Um, Lisp is a very fascinating language. Um, Scheme itself is also extremely fascinating. Um, and you'll find a lot of different languages borrow a lot from Lisp. Python recently got Lambda expression, JavaScript uh, basically is, is a scheme underneath. Uh, Java just got Lambdas, I think, in 1.8 or something like that. They, they got some funky syntax because that's the way of Java. Um, anywho, so further reading, um, these are all links in GitHub. Um, so if you want to take a look at that, there's a book, Structures and Interpretations of Computer Programming, which was based off of a course over at MIT. Um, up until recently, they, they just changed it over to Python, or 2008 recently. Um, how, design, how to Design Programs is another freely available one. Realm of Racket, uh, you can get over at NoStarch. The Guile Manual, the Guile Manual is amazing. Uh, that's where I learned a lot of the scheme um, that I showed you today. And then there's a book, The Little Schemer and the Season Schemer. Uh, it's kind of a Socratic way of learning scheme. I didn't like it, I hated it, but some people really enjoy it. It's a classic text, so I put it on there for you to check out. And there's also some websites as well. Um, there's also, uh, someone did uh, the what is it? Structures and in, in Interpretation of Computer Programming, examples in uh, Guile as well. And then there's a page called Learn Scheme in 15 minutes.
Yeah, yes. We do. We do. Thank you. 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 Thank you.